Okay, so um, I, I like just saying, well, I, I know you understand a little bit of Spanish, Jason Sebastian, but just um, thanking you for uh, being here. Also, Juan Jose, uh, for us, is, is very interesting. And I guess this is a way we are trying to innovate and make um, our courses more interesting for our students and getting to know what is the current situation that in, in regarding solar energy in, in, in your countries will be very interesting for us and then comparing with what is happening also here in Costa Rica. Um, so um, we're going to start with Joyce. Um, um, so Joyce, please uh, tell us what is going on in Canada about the solar energy. Okay. Hey, thanks, Carlos. Uh, good morning to everyone out there. I, I wish we could be there. Uh, I could be there in person, but this is our best choice right now. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Meza for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, sure. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what's going on in um, Canada in solar PV. And I'm just going to, I've got a few slides for you. Let me just uh, open those up. Uh, yeah, so here we go. So I hope you can see okay. Um, please um, tell uh, uh, your professor if you can't see something. Um, yeah, so I am in British Columbia, which is the province in the west uh, side of Canada. And uh, Canada as a country uh, does a little bit better than average compared to the world. So, you know, you can see here the, the world uses on average 13.6% renewable energy in their energy supply. And Canada's a little bit better with 17.3%. Um, if you look at where Canada gets its uh, energy from, you can see that it's about two thirds hydro. So uh, Canada is very lucky in their hydroelectric potential. I think maybe that's something we have in common with uh, Costa Rica. Um, and there's, there's other sources as well, uh, but solar photovoltaic you can see is, is really quite small still. Uh, so um, not too much of the Canadian supply comes from solar PV right now. Um, uh, moving on, the, uh, the solar PV is growing. There was a period of a lot of growth kind of in, in uh, the, the, uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, it, it's now leveling off and um, I'll tell you a little bit uh, more about that in a moment. Uh, but you can see kind of all together, we're in 3000 megawatts area, uh, you know, three, three gigawatts altogether in that region anyway. Uh, and it is growing slowly, you know, so there is some growth every year, but like I say, the, uh, the amount of growth has, has uh, uh, been decreasing. Uh, I, I included this slide, I, I thought it was uh, interesting. You can st see still the same uh, growth picture coming to roughly, you know, the, the three gigawatts that we were talking about a moment ago. Um, but this, this growth curve now on this slide, they break it into three sections. So the, the dark blue section is grid connected centralized solar PV. Uh, here we're talking about uh, a solar PV plant or solar PV farm, whichever way you like to say it. And uh, the, the green color is grid connected distributed. So distributed, it could be on a person's home, it could be on the roof of a business, a commercial place, a warehouse, something like that. Uh, but it's more distributed around, not just uh, in one central uh, location. And then a very small part you can see uh, in you know, kind of light purple or something like that, uh, and that's off-grid use. So um, in, in BC, there's uh, areas where people have, for instance, a cabin on a mountain somewhere, and uh, there they have no other source of, of energy, and so they might use off-grid solar. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the challenges in BC is it's, uh, it's not a small place, and some of the areas where you might best um, collect could be wind energy, tidal energy, um, they're a long way from where people live so you need to find a way to transmit the energy from where you collect it to where you use it of course and uh, so sometimes that's not practical and hence the off-grid use sometimes so um yeah uh where is canada's solar resource so here's a map of canada i don't know how you, how well you know canada there that, that's where i am there in the west in victoria so um it's a little earlier here than costa rica about eight o'clock and uh um 
actually the, the places with the greatest hydro uh, potential, the ones that are driving most of re the renewable energy is, is BC, which is here and Quebec, which is over here. Um, as you can see in this map, the, the best solar resource is sort of in the center of Canada. Um, so the provinces are, the, this guy with the X there is Alberta, maybe I should use an A for that, and then next to it Saskatchewan. So, and maybe a little bit of Manitoba next to that. So those three provinces are the places where the solar resource is the strongest. I, I was noticing just last night actually that the, the units here, I don't know if you can read it, I'll just write it a little bit bigger. I feel like it's a little bit of an unusual way to express it, kilowatt hours per kilowatt. So. So that really works out to how many hours of full sun occur probably on a horizontal surface uh, in, in a year. And so where um, an, a full sun is one kilowatt, uh, one kilowatt per square meter. So like to me, what's a little bit more customary for this would be to say how much energy arrives for every square meter of horizontal surface, but it, it says the same thing. So if you look at the numbers on that bar there, in the red, you're in roughly 1400 uh, hours of um, full sun per year on average. So the interesting part about that is if you ask where are uh, Canada's biggest solar plants, um, you find they are not in the center of Canada. <laughs> um, this is sort of a terrible graph, but you can kind of see here a smattering of orange circles. I, I don't know if you can quite see them. But you'll notice that none of them are in Alberta, Saskatchewan, or Manitoba. And the reason for that actually is that uh, the province of Ontario, where all of those orange dots are, had uh, between 2009 and 2017 a program called Feed in Tariff, where uh, they paid for uh, people to sell their energy to the Ontario uh, Power uh, Company. And in the early part of that uh, period, the uh, price was very high uh, compared to what it is now. Uh, so it was 80 cents Canadian, um, and that's about 326 uh, uh, colones um, for every kilowatt hour. So uh, in BC now, for just so you know, it's 10 cents about. So it's one eighth of what it was at that time. So there was a, a big push in Ontario. Lots of people wanted to sell their energy to BC Hydro, and which is the name of the company there. Um, and there was a lot of plants installed on the basis of these contracts. Um, but they, they later found that the, they, th some of the errors they made was there were, they didn't, uh, um, the contracts were not competitive. So just they ended up paying tons of people, tons of money for, uh, for energy that was much too expensive. And as you can see over the years, the price went down. So um, now uh, at the end of the program, not now, it was closed a couple of years ago, but it was about a quarter of what it was at the beginning. Uh, so you can see if you look at all the provinces, you don't have to memorize them all, but um, mainly notice that Ontario, that province with those dots, has by far the biggest contribution to Canada's um, uh, picture. And that's where the, the biggest plants are. So BC, where I live, is, is this guy, and um, there's still a, still a lot of room to grow there. So in BC, what we have, we call it a net metering program. So uh, this program is, uh, can be for residential customers. It can also be for commercial customers uh, for anything up to 100 kilowatts. So the idea is if you uh, generate more electricity than you use, then you get some credit. And that credit can be applied to your own future consumption. Uh, there's a smart meter that uh, measures how much electricity you used and how much you generated, and it monitors that on an hourly basis, actually. And uh, there's a, a kind of a contracted period of five years during which the, um, the customers can obtain, like I said, it was almost 10 cents, so 9.99 cents per kilowatt hour, which is about 41 uh, Costa Rican colones per kilowatt hour. So uh, the price isn't high the way it was in Ontario, so there, there's been slightly less incentive to, to do that. Uh, but the, the, the number of customers taking part is definitely growing. So here's a picture of 
what's happening with the number of customers. This is since the, uh, since the program's inception in 2004. So, I mean, now we're used to looking at pandemic graphs, so we all know how exponential it is. Uh, until recently, it's been flattening off um, uh, more, but it's still continuing to grow. So the number of customers is growing and also the total capacity. It's kind of interesting if you, if you look at, if you break it down. So the, um, if you look at what those customers are doing, they can actually generate energy any way they like, but 95% uh, of them uh, choose to use solar PV. A very small proportion use hydro. Those would be a type of, like a run of river type of installation. Um, so, uh, or um, yeah, that's the most common type. So a small scale hydro, but most of the customers that are using this net metering program uh, have solar PV installations of some kind. They're definitely the most popular. Um, if you look at uh, sort of the size of those installations, there's, um, you know, there's a range of sizes, but most of the uh, systems are less than 10, 10 kilowatts in size. And even the most are even smaller than that, at most uh, below five kilowatts. So not very uh, big systems. These are, ta we're talking about people's residences or small businesses and so on that have some kind of uh, solar PV on the, on the roof. So uh, they noticed in, um, uh, like in one of the reports in 2018 that out of all those customers, so how many were there? So I don't know, right now there's almost 2000 customers. So in 2018, only five of those 1800 or so customers where we're getting about 75% of the payments uh, and they were getting large payments. So 28,000 to $74,000 in surplus energy payments. So they were generating much more than they were using. Uh, the vast majority of those 1800 customers did not get any energy payout. So in other words, so for this group, uh, the solar energy uh, that they collected was all used as credits towards their own energy use. So uh, BC Hydro uh, was kind of reevaluating that uh, because they realized that those five customers are not sort of typical residences or businesses or small commercial enterprises. They're, they're clearly doing this with the, the view to earning money on their solar PV uh, installation. So they decided that those, those are more like power producers and their solution uh, that they're planning is that customers in the last line here uh, will will only be allowed to have a solar PV generation up to 110% of their estimated load. So that if you're a house and you've used a certain number of kilowatt hours per year on average, then your solar PV can only be a little bit bigger than that. So that you're not in the business of trying to uh, generate uh, an energy in order to earn money from BC Hydro, that it's designed to offset your own use. There are some issues with that as well, that uh, for instance, people with um, passive, like well-designed passive homes have a very low annual load. So that's really a bit restrictive on their solar PV. So there's some sort of subtleties to that, but that's the main idea that you're, you're only gonna be able to um, have solar similar to your own use. So that also brings up the question of uh, the anniversary date. Um, once every uh, um, 12 months, you can get uh, your payout. So let's say um, at the end of the year, you've, you've generated more than you've used, so they send you a check. But there's a big question of when does that date happen? So if, if you, let's say the date is September the 1st, the summer just finished here in uh, Victoria, and uh, you've generated a lot of solar energy, and you get a big check because you've just finished generating it all. You haven't had a chance to use it. Uh, but then you have to pay for your energy during the winter because you no longer have credits on your account. So they decided that for most people, for most people, the goal is to avoid having to pay money to hydro. So they, they've chosen March the 1st as the date so that 
you would have a chance to collect your solar energy during the summer months here, which would be like June, July, August, part of September. Then you would use them as much as possible through the coldest months of the year here in Victoria, which aren't very cold, but anyway. Um, and then by March, it's kind of a good time to reckon and say, okay, now we can kind of see if you're ahead or behind and we adjust at that time. Uh, they do allow for customers to make a different selection if they prefer, but that's kind of the default. So um, since that adjustment only happens once every year, that's kind of the, uh, a reasonable choice anyway for most people. Uh, like in many places, I think the rules are evolving as we go. So um, I've just, I was just going to kind of mention a few of these places where things are, are shifting a little bit. One is um, that that price, that 9.99 Canadian cents per kilowatt hour, BC Hydro is now thinking that they should uh, kind of make that number float with the market value of the energy, uh, you know, so to kind of, uh, whether that still happens by contract or not, it's not been decided, but that, that in other words, that price should reflect what its value is in the market. Um, another thing that, that is becoming sort of interesting to people or, or more common is, that they might lease solar equipment in order to do to participate in this net metering program. There's a concern uh, that third bu bullet here that uh, so like I don't have solar on my roof and part of what I pay to BC Hydro is uh, towards their infrastructure and paying for all the things that they need. Um, net metering customers don't really pay, pay their fair share of that because they can um, they, they get these credits moving forward that could be spent even at times when energy is more expensive, uh, but their credits sort of place equal value on what was collected and what is spent. So right at the moment, there's so few net metering customers, it's not really an issue, but as that becomes bigger, uh, they feel like that should be addressed somehow so that they're not really paying towards all the building of the infrastructure by the program structure. And that kind of leads to that fourth point that, uh, in some places in our province, the energy grid uh, is quite maximized already. So to add additional solar PV becomes a concern and an expense. And currently BC Hydro pays those connection costs. So that's another question going forward. Um, there's some places where there's unauthorized generators that they're working on getting rid of. And, and then just kind of finally, that uh, one new interesting idea is where you and uh, perhaps a, a cooperative of neighbors maybe might have a several PV panels and you share what comes in and you also share what goes out uh, to kind of uh, you know offset your your costs. So those are just kind of a few a few ideas of what's going on here in Canada. Um, yeah like I think later on at the end of the hour we'll have time for questions if you want. Um, thank you Joyce very much. Yeah, I remind everyone that we will have the questions at the end. Uh, así que si tienen unas preguntas, hay una sección de Q&A abajo donde pueden hacer sus preguntas y luego al final nada más para, para llevar esto más fluido y no quitarle tiempo a los otros speakers, entonces los vamos a estar moviendo para el final. Okay, thank you Joyce. Very interesting. Actually very similar to what uh, we have here in Costa Rica. So um, Sebastian is going to let us know about what is the current situation of solar energy in Germany. So Sebastian, please. Yeah, I just try to share my screen. Okay. Hey, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. So I would like to uh, give you a bit idea of the German situation of solar energy here, which is uh, right now, yeah, we have passed 20 years of our transition to renewable. Um, and actually it's a, what's quite uh, complicated, but I try to give you a bit of uh, an overview of all this last 20 years, what changed in Germany and what is the current situation right now. Um, so there will be a short introduction and the uh, grid structure, what we have in Germany. And just a pointer here. Uh, and then showing you a little bit the PV plans, what we have and how also the, some technical requirements we have. 
okay, so this was just advertising for our university, but they want just to show you a little bit where we are located. So we, are, we are right in the center of Germany, but two hours south of Berlin. So we're doing also some, a lot of uh, research on PV systems. Um, but yeah, coming to the energy, and I give you some, actually some energy facts or fun facts about Germany. So usually Germany is, yeah, people say that's quite green or green in energy production, what we have, but we have to be also on, we have a huge economy and uh, we are actually the large consumer of prim primary energy in, in Europe and actually the seventh highest globally and we actually uh, admit quite a lot of uh, CO2, so we are in the top 10 actually. However, we try actually to change this. And um, so um, the goal actually Germany has, it's called the Energiewende. So I put it here in German and sometimes you hear this, is actually the trans, uh, transition from, uh, from a very yeah, coal and nuclear uh, energy mix to a low carbon coal and nuclear free energy mix. So we have the goal that we want to reduce actually the uh, greenhouse gases by uh, 80 to 95 percent by 2050. And we actually already by law that we are phasing out the nuclear power plants by 2020. So it's already in two years. We will get rid of all the nuclear power plants we have. And actually last year we decided to get uh, out of the coal power plants by uh, 2038. Um, yeah, so the story actually is now 20 years. So 20 years ago, the German government actually started with the so-called Renewable Energy Act on German Erneuerbare Energiegesetz, uh, which actually um, guarantee a fixed price for uh, all renewable energy, so not only uh, photovoltaics, but also wind and um, hydro over 20 years. So the, for example, the feed-in tariff for photovoltaics was at that time 25 euro cents. So quite 25, I don't know what this is in, in colonies, but it's roughly also 25 uh, dollar cents. As well, we defined there that all uh, the renewables have actually the priority in the grid. Um, so this was a very big step to start and actually in, over the last 20 years you see that actually the German households, even you see also in your household probably that uh, electrical devices increase, so you have more TVs, you have uh, computers and all other technical things. However, in Germany over the 20, last 20 years the energy consumption was reduced by 10% uh, in the households compared to the US you see here that actually increased by 20%. So that is also the fact because we have quite a lot of residential TV system which reduce actually the demand of energy into the grid which I will show you a little bit later. Okay, uh, first of all I give you a short um, overview about the grid structure. Um, it's, this is maybe different to North and South America. So here I just wrote down the um, high voltage grid, what we have. So the transmission between uh, over Germany, between the towns. And in residential, actually, we have this system 230 to 400 volts and 50 hertz. Um, so in the picture, you see the transmission line. Actually, the red ones, the one are right now under construction. So we have in the last years quite a lot of work to do to build new transmission lines due to the fact that we have quite a lot of renewable energy uh, distributed over Germany. Mostly the north part is wind energy, but a lot of industry are actually sitting in the south. So we need to bring the energy from the north to the south. And actually the uh, solar PV plants, it's located more in the south. So I'm talking about the huge uh, commercial PV plants, which are in the south due to the fact that uh, we have more sun in the south than in the north. So here you see the map. Um, this is actually what we had in the first presentation. So in Germany, it's roughly, if you're talking about kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak, it's roughly 1,000, 1,100 uh, you can produce with the PV plant in the south. In the north, it's a little bit less. 
Um, so due to all those transition to renewable, uh, 20 years ago, also Germany decided that we split actually generation and the distribution um, within Germany. Uh, so actually to have a, um, yeah, a market, uh, energy market and not a monopole, which is then deals with only one company. So we have actually four transition companies, which are indicated here in uh, different colors over Germany. And we have actually four major utility companies, which are separated from the grid. So the grid companies operating only in the grid. And then we have the, uh, this, uh, the generation. So in the map here, you see actually four big companies. So those companies also um, run all the nuclear power plants and the coal power plants, which are, yeah, in the future, they have to change a lot if they would like to survive. So however, with this huge uh, market or free market, we have actually uh, unlimited energy providers. So we have thousands of companies which are buying and selling energy. So you can actually uh, have a contract, even you live in Berlin, you can get a contract with the energy company, which is located, for example, in Munich. And there are also a lot of companies which are selling only uh, renewable and or electricity from renewable sources. So this is a very flexible market also for the consumer. Um, so with, within this system, actually to have a free market, we Germany introduced actually, um, yeah, it's kind of a stock market, it's now called the European Energy Exchange. So it's like what you have in New York, the stock exchange where they are dealing with uh, a lot of money. Here they are selling and um, uh, buying energy. So actually the price in Germany, the energy price is not stable. It depends really on the amount of energy which is produced per day. So in this graph, you see I just picked uh, a day in uh, April. So there we have a lot of sun. You see we have a lot of a high amount of energy from uh, solar power and the high of energy, which is in green, is wind power. And the gray part is actually the conventional power plants. And based on this, they are uh, calculating the price. And you see sometimes even the price is negative because we have more energy in Germany due to the renewable sources than we can actually consume into the grid. So it means all this energy because the um, nuclear power plants are not so flexible to get down with the energy. Um, we get to get rid of this energy. So actually they are selling the uh, electricity for, yeah, almost nothing or actually get money out of this. However, for the single consumer like me, for a residential house, it doesn't matter because the energy price is actually fixed. So actually the money is made from all the producer and companies there. Um, so to give you a little bit of idea in this graph, you see actually the evolution of the price from 20 years ago when we started with the change to renewable. And there you see actually in blue is the only the price for the production and for the grid. Um, and the, um, yeah, what is this purple? This is all the taxes what you have because all the systems, the change from renewable, uh, from, uh, to the renewable energy, uh, the money has to come from something. And this is based actually on taxes. So this is the tax on the energy prices. So ease house, household actually price the bill for the energy transition. Um, so to give you a bit the idea what uh, is the cost here. So for a household, residential, so we pay around 30 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And for commercial, so big companies actually, they are paying less taxes. And so the prices are around five to 15 euro cents. Good. So coming to more to the technical things here, I just have a graph which shows the uh, inst uh, installed electricity generation capacity in Germany. Again, so this is 18 years ago. Um, on the beginning, you see in uh, yellow is solar. It's not very visible. And there actually started the, the law to have a fixed uh, feed-in tariff. And then we see that the growth of uh, solar actually increased. I will show you later another graph. Just to give you an overview, how are the share of uh, electricity generation we have here? So you see that we have, if we focus on solar, we have about 
right now to 2020, 50 gigawatt uh, installed capacity, which is about 24% of the whole amount of uh, installed capacity. So if we consider also hydro as a renewable energy, the share is right now this year of 59% of renewable energy in Germany. Good, so here actually is the same graph, but this is just to show you with uh, in the energy amount. So this is average over the 2019. So what I want to point out is that we have an average of 46% of new renewable energy. Um, and, but if you look into single month, so here I have an example from last April. So I have to be honest, this was very sunny there. Uh, so we have about 60% of renewable um, produced by renewable energy. And this is only solar already 20% what we produce with solar within Germany. Good, so coming to the um, photovoltaic installation, and actually this is a bit the graph what we saw a bit different to the one we saw for Canada. So what I told you 20 years ago, we started with this uh, law and to uh, actually pay uh, a fixed fit in tariff for the photovoltaics. And then it starts to grow until around 2011. We have the highest peak. So about uh, eight gigawatts was new installation in Germany of PV. So this is actually due to the Renewable Energy Act, what we have. So where we have 25 cents per kilowatt hour, and this was a guarantee for your PV plant over 20 years. Um, then, of course, the energy prices went up, and also the political system changed, and some ideas were different. Um, so we have actually changed the laws quite a lot, and well, there were many changes. So first of all, they uh, went down with the fit-in tariff. They put tenders for large PV system, which are very complicated to run out and a lot of other things. So actually, if you build a PV plant in Germany, you don't have, you need, don't need a, really an engineer, you need a lawyer because there are so many regulations right now there. However, what we see actually in the last years that the increase of installed photovoltaics increase again. And that is mostly due to the fact, first of all, we need uh, more renewable energy in the grid to reach our goals but also because uh, photovoltaic power plants become economically, even without the fit-in tariff. Okay, so coming to some um, PV plants, what we have in Germany, a bit of overview. So I split this in commercial and residential, we see later. Commercial, I call it here, so this is a huge PV plant, actually, yeah, uh, more than 750 kilowatt peaks, so this is also in our regulation defined. Um, if you build smaller PVs up to 750 kilowatt peak, you get uh, currently a fit-in tariff of 7 cents per kilowatt hours over 20 years. So this is a fixed price. If you build bigger PV plants, there is this public tender, which is something quite complicated. The companies apply for it and they have to state actually or calculate the energy price. And actually those companies that have the lowest price, they win this tender and then they can start to build. So in 2018, this was around 5.5 .5 cents per kilowatt hours. Um, to give you an idea about the sizes of the commercial um, PV plants, so we have, they are between 50 and 145, but they have to say, more than 500 megawatt peak, they are quite, yeah, they are less PV plants what we have. So close to our university, actually, we have a quite a huge one, 52 megawatt PV plant, which you see here in the picture, just to show you the dimension. It was an old airport. They converted this in a PV plant. Um, so this year they start to build, one company built, uh, Actually, this will be the largest one in, in Germany with 175 megawatt peak. And the good news here is this company actually builds this without any public funding and any fit in tariff. So that means they really build it and this is commercial. Uh, they can run it actually commercial and get out of money. So this is a very good news. 
that actually the price of PV is much cheaper than they which come out from coal power plants. Um, some technical things, uh, yeah, there's not so much uh, to say. Uh, those PV plants are actually uh, connected direct to the high voltage systems, for example, 110 kilovolts or higher. However, there's always the energy management, which is actually controlled by the grid company. So if they, if we have too much energy actually from the PV, they also can reduce it from the grid companies. Um, so currently the problem is what we have with those huge PV plants is actually it's more and more not really um, to build them, but it's actually to find the place. And we get in conflict with agriculture, we get with conflict with the nature itself um, because we put them and maybe have to cut some trees and stuff like this and so there is uh, much going on actually to, to put together those sectors so for example there is those it's called agro pv so there's this pv plants where you combine agriculture and pv systems for example this little uh, picture here so you have some animals under the things and they eat the grass for example or you even uh, grow vegetables under the uh, PV modules. Other thing is to uh, <clears throat> combine biodiversity in photovoltaics actually to promote um, yeah, plants to grow under the modules, which also uh, bring back insects and stuff like this. The other things, what is uh, one important thing in Germany right now on the discussion of floating PV, because we have all those coal mining um, areas in South Germany or East South Germany, uh, where in the end become lakes, and there is the idea also to use those lakes for PV. And the other big topic, and this is I think the most uh, critical thing, is storage, and there are some uh, under investigation also in implementation already. For example, power to gas or thermal storage. Okay, so I think I'm running out of time. However, coming a bit to the residential PV plants, and that's quite a lot what we have in Germany. So until last year, it was more than 100 million residential PV plants, which are smaller than 10 kilowatt peaks. Um, there are actually no really specific technical requirements. The only thing what you need, what you see in the picture is a bidirectional meter. Uh, which gives you actually the energy what you feed in into the grid and what you take from the grid. In the past, there was an extra meter for the PV system because they direct fit into the grid, but this we don't have any more since I think 10 years, so it's just one meter. So actually, your PV plant is connected to your uh, household grid, you say, and then uh, they count just the energy which is going out and out. So here you get actually right now a fixed fit in tariff of 11 cents per kilowatt hour, which is also guaranteed by 20 years. Uh, you see that is not much. And if you remember, the household pays uh, 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So it makes more sense to actually use your own energy. And there are a lot of systems which are right now on the market, actually so like smart homes to control actually the self-consumption, to increase the self-consumption. If we're talking about a bit the cost, um, yeah, those rooftop systems, so including uh, modules, uh, inverter, and also to put them, install them, and plug them, it's about, it's less than 1,000 euros per kilowatt you pay here. And usually, yeah, you can actually reduce in Germany your energy amount. If you play a little bit with the demand, what you have, then you get also 30 to 40%. You can reduce your energy or the cost of the energy. Um, so last two years, actually, actually, there is more going to PV system for residential application with storage. Um, again, there's no really, technical requirements so you just put the uh, battery in your system and you have this uh, inverter for the battery to charge and then to convert this so uh, what all we know probably know what is on the market like the tesla lg you can use in your household with those systems you could be increase your self-consumption up to 60 percent however those systems are quite expensive um, still so mainly the battery is the uh, 
uh, driver of the cost. So it's about 12,000 euros you pay for a small system. The government has some funding for this, so you can get some money out of this. However, people are really running and trying to, to buy those things and put them in, in, the, in their house. But actually right now with those prices, this system are still uneconomical. So if you really um, calculate the price of your energy, it's much higher if you just use a standard TV system, which is grid connected. But people actually yeah, in Germany, they like it too. They say, okay, I do something for the environment. And they are trying also to be more independent from the grid owner. Um, a lot of discussion is right now electrical cars uh, to use them also as a storage in the PV system, which is right now not possible. Technically, yes, but actually uh, in German regulation, it's not allowed to have a battery which can move. So this is not written in those standards what we have. So a battery has to be fixed standing in your basement and not uh, running away. Uh, some other application we have said last year we have a new regulation that you can actually also to give people the have which have just a small house or maybe just a flat somewhere there are so-called balcony PV so this is a plug in a plug and play system so actually you really buy a photovoltaic model you place it on your balcony or on your balcony wherever and you have a micro inverter and you really plug it in just to your outlet in your house. So there will be a special one. Um, the only requirement what you have here is that you have a meter which is uh, with a reverse lock. That, so you get not paid for, for the energy which goes into the grid. And also they want to avoid that your meter is running backwards that you reduce actually your energy bill. So that has to be avoided that so all the energy actually you have to use in your house. Um, yeah, this is just a short summary, and I think I'm then in the end of the presentation. I was in front of you. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian, very much um, for your presentation. Um, we will continue with uh, Juan Jose Negroni. Juan Jose. Uh, Es profesor, como había dicho, en la Universidad de Santo Tomás. También ha, ha estado muy relacionado en energía solar fotovoltaica desde hace ya bastantes años. Entonces, Juan José, por favor. Ok, thank you for the invitation. I feel more comfortable speaking in Spanish. Ok. Um, ok. Um, bien. Uh, para comenzar un poco uh, el tema, uh, quiero compartir con ustedes ahí el, el largo país que es Chile. Eh, podemos ver acá y vamos a ver eh, cuál es la radiación de Chile. ¿cierto? Aquí podemos ver que Chile se divide ¿cierto? en 16 regiones, eh, es muy largo. Eh, la parte más ancha está en esta zona y esta es la parte más angosta que llega a 90 kilómetros, ¿no? Desde mar a cordillera. Cordillera, todo esto es la cordillera de los Andes. Eh, Chile tiene especialmente una muy buena radiación solar. Eh, desde la zona norte, que, que se nota eh, por acá, en donde se ubica la mayor cantidad de mineras que consumen muchísima energía, además, ¿no? Tiene una excelente radiación. Eh, eh, en esta zona están los telescopios más grandes del mundo, ubicados, ¿cierto? Que, que son con espejos. Y obviamente tiene una muy alta radiancia. Aquí, un poco en radiancia global, podemos ver que llega a 1300 watts metros cuadrados, ¿no? Y, y si lo medimos en, en, en energía por, por metro cuadrado, se pueden fijar que llegamos a los 3.800 kilowatt hora metro cuadrado. Um, la matriz energética de Chile se compone, eh, como ven acá, ¿cierto? De, de energía renovable y también energía no renovable. En el caso de la energía renovable, la energía solar eh, tiene aproximadamente un 11,2% de ocupación. Eh, Chile es un, un, un país que tiene el, casi la mejor radiación del mundo. Eh, estamos recién empezando a explotar 
eh, esta, gran, esta gran potencialidad. Eh, en el sistema global, eh, Chile, a partir de, del año 2020, el sistema eléctrico nacional logró unirse eh, para poder tener una, una mayor distribución de capacidades. Eh, como pueden ver, eh, muy parecido a lo que ocurre en Canadá, eh, la parte hidroeléctrica es la que tiene la mayor cantidad ¿cierto? Eh, de porcentaje y ahí se puede ver ¿cierto? que alcanza un, un 20 y pico por ciento, 26, 27 por ciento más o menos. Y eh, la geotérmica, ¿cierto? estamos comenzando realmente con ella a pesar de que tenemos un cordón cordillerano eh, que, que a, a primera vista puede, pudiese ser muy atractivo, sin embargo la exploración eh, es muy, de muy alto costo. Eh, que, que en Chile el mercado en general, el mercado chileno, eh, se compone de tres segmentos. Uno, la generación que finalmente son privados que deciden una inversión en términos de ubicación, tecnología y tamaño y eh, una libre competencia. Eh, esto tiene riesgos de mercado porque se enfrentan a través de contratos, de licitaciones, etc. Y está también esto de los clientes libres y clientes regulados. ¿no? Y, y tenemos un mercado spot eh, que toma a, a todos los que están en generación actualmente, que ya vamos a ver eh, eh, que son una cantidad eh, significativa. El otro, el otro proveedor o el, el otro cierto actividad del sector eléctrico es la transmisión. Existen eh, monopolios regulados, ¿cierto? En donde se licitan la adjudicación de, la, de las líneas de transmisión. Y finalmente se ubica eh, la distribución, que también son monopolios regulados porque están concesionados en función de la distribución del país. Eh, Chile tiene un sistema interconectado desde la, la parte más norte hasta la parte sur, bastante sur, ¿no? en donde comparten absolutamente todo, eh, se comparte totalmente la, la transmisión, ¿cierto? la generación y la distribución se hace por zonas locales. ¿Vale? Eh, hay dos pequeños sistemas interconectados que son muy pequeños porque esta zona, eh, esta zona que ustedes ven acá es una zona llena de islas y, y muy al sur de Chile eh, hay mucho bosque, mucha vegetación y mucho frío también, ¿no? Eh, eh, pero sin embargo en la zona más extrema hay gas natural y, y es donde más fuerte está eh, puesta en el mercado y son mercados muy pequeños. La distribución política de, de Chile en esto, ¿cierto? Eh, se compone de, de tres grandes puntos, el Estado como, un, eh, como una agencia pública responsable del sector, en función de los planes, las políticas, los estándares relacionados con el sector energético, y eh, además otorga las concesiones para las plantas. Eh, tanto hidroeléctrica, así como las líneas de transmisión, las subestaciones, etc. Uh, hay un ente, ¿cierto?, que también es parte del Estado, que es la Comisión Nacional de Energía. Depende, obviamente, del Ministerio y es responsable de estudiar los precios, las tarifas, los estándares técnicos, fijan las tarifas eh, de acuerdo con la normativa aplicable eh, de los informes de precios. Entonces, genera un, es un ente de regulación, ¿no? Y por otro lado, está la Superintendencia de Electricidad y Combustible, que se ubica acá, ¿cierto? que fiscaliza que todo se cumpla de acuerdo a lo que se está estableciendo. Después hay unas entidades independientes que se conoce como el coordinación, la, la Coordinación Nacional Eléctrica, ¿cierto? que lo que hace es preservar la seguridad operacional y la seguridad del sistema eléctrico. Ellos garantizan la operación y, y ponen de acuerdo a todo el sector privado ¿no? que está relacionado con 
la generación, la transmisión, la distribuidora. Es la que se preocupa de, de los accesos abiertos y que todo vaya en función de la ley. Y ustedes pueden ver que en cuanto a generadoras, tenemos 150 empresas que se dedican a la generación eléctrica a lo largo del país. Tenemos siete empresas que hacen la distribución, perdón, la transmisión eléctrica y 20 empresas que hacen distribución en global en Chile. Y además de los clientes libres, estos clientes libres principalmente son mineras que tienen altos consumos de energía y hay muchas empresas que directamente compran, eh, estas mineras compran a ciertas generadoras ¿cierto? dentro del mercado. En términos globales, eh, Chile tiene un gran potencial de energía, tanto hidroeléctrica, solar, eólica, térmica. Se ha estimado que eh, la penetración eh, de la energía solar eh, llegaría a unos 20 gigawatts de aquí al 2050. Tiene un enorme potencial de desarrollo. Eh, pero, sin embargo, este sistema fotovoltaico necesita respaldo. La principal zona de desarrollo del sistema, de los sistemas solares se, se produce en el norte para sistemas a grande escala. Para sistemas a pequeña escala, ya vamos a ver más adelante, se tienen algunas otras consideraciones. Y que ha tenido mayor penetración en la zona centro. Sin embargo, como ustedes pueden ver, dado que tenemos 4.300 kilómetros de costa, eh, la energía eólica eh, toma un, un, gran, un gran valor en esta zona, ¿no? a, a lo largo de todo Chile. Y la geotermia que se está explorando muchísimo en la zona norte y así como en la zona centro. Y como, como tal como en Canadá, la hidroeléctrica también en las zonas más boscosas tiene mucho que decir. Um, en términos globales, eh, en Chile se propuso como meta que al menos un 70% de la generación al 2050 sea de energía renovable, tanto de, de, de toda aquella solar, biomasa, etc. Y ustedes pueden ver un poco cuál es la distribución acá, ¿cierto? de llegar al 2050, cuáles son las expectativas de Chile respecto a este desarrollo. Los nuevos estudios han impulsado, eh, impulsado por las generadoras ya están estimando que al 2030 el 75% de la generación podría ser renovable y en donde el 30% podría ser energía solar fotovoltaica. Ah, esto es bastante propicioso en términos de que ya se está construyendo en Chile, hay, eh, la empresa Bengoa está haciendo concentración solar y hay plantas de gran magnitud en el norte de Chile. Uh, para poder tratar bien este, este tema, tenemos que separar claramente los dos mundos de la energía solar. Eh, los grandes proyectos en el mercado eléctrico y los pequeños y medianos proyectos que tienen que ver con el autoconsumo. Eh, para ello, ¿cierto? podemos ver que en Chile, en cuanto a, a, grande, perdón, ¿sí? en cuanto a grandes proyectos, perdón, uh, Aquí tengo un... Vamos con esta primero, ¿no? En cuanto a grandes proyectos, en Chile se han declarado... Eh, se han declarado hasta ahora, hasta el mes pasado, ¿cierto? En términos globales, a, aproximadamente 12.000 eh, megawatts, ¿no? En conexión de los cuales en solar fotovoltaico hay una gran expectativa porque eh, ya está aprobado, ¿cierto? Eh, 18.000 mega están aprobados y ya están en construcción eh, 2000 de ellos. Ahí en el 2018 se generó una ley que se, se, llam, se llamaba la Ley de Energía Renovable, ¿cierto? Y se introdujo una cuota de alimentación para la energía renovable. Sí, desde el 2010, todas las compañías que producen energía eh, deben proporcionar una participación anual del 5% proveniente de fuentes de energía renovable. Eh, esto, a partir del 2015, este porcentaje iba a aumentar cada año a un total de 10% para el 2024. Esta ley introdujo certificado, etc. Actualmente ya sobrepasamos las metas de, del, del 2020. 
desde el 2025 en realidad. Entonces se está estudiando nuevas metas para poder llegar eh, tranquilamente al 2050, en donde Chile quiere ser libre eh, de emisiones de carbono eh, y eliminar todas sus plantas térmicas de carbón. Eh, Ustedes pueden ver acá de estos proyectos. Eh, fíjense que el 46% de, eh, de, de, de esta tecnología nueva eh, en energía renovable no convencional es eh, de energía solar. ¿Mm? Eh, en el otro sentido, para, para pequeños, eh, pequeños consumos o instalaciones menores a 20 megawatts, existe una ley que es, se le llamó ley corta, que brinda a todos los productores de electricidad acceso al mercado spot independiente de su capacidad. ¿Mm? Si pueden entrar a este, a este comercio spot. Y aquí pueden vender electricidad a un costo marginal y la energía provista a un, a un precio, ¿cierto?, que es local dentro de todo. Se requiere que los operadores eh, proporcionen, ¿cierto?, una conexión a la red y tengan derecho a suministrar electricidad. Esta ley se divide en, en, en dos grandes partes. Una, la ley de net billing, que comenzó llamándose net metering, pero finalmente se estabilizó en un net billing, ya lo vamos a convertir vamos a conversar. Y por otro lado, eh, los pequeños medios de generación distribuidos que tienen este intervalo. Los pequeños medios de generación distribuidos y de 9 megawatts a 20 megawatts están y existen los eh, medianos medios de generación distribuida, ¿vale? que también eh, tienen cierta, unas ciertas regulaciones diferentes respecto al mercado. Pero finalmente, lo que establece esta gran diferencia es que para instalaciones Menores de 100 kilowatts son consideradas instalaciones fotovoltaicas, eh, ¿cierto?, que ingresan a la ley de net billing y por lo tanto están dentro del sistema distribuido, eh, ingresando dentro de las ciudades. Y en este aspecto, la, esta ley de net billing, esta ley, eh, es la ley chilena que permite el proceso de facturación neta. Se aprobó ahí en el año 2012 y entró en vigencia el 2014. El tamaño de la instalación que se va a conectar a la red no puede sobrepasar una capacidad total de 100 kilowatts. El objetivo de la ley tenía la intención de incentivar la generación distribuida únicamente para la inyección a la red y finalmente propiciar el autoconsumo. Entonces, ¿cuál, cuál es eh, esta, este propiciar el autoconsumo? La ley funciona como net billing y por lo tanto las inyecciones que realizan las personas en pequeñas empresas son valorizadas al precio que la empresa de distribución traspasa a sus clientes conforme a los precios regulados por decreto. Lo que, lo que en estricto rigor significa es que para un usuario de baja tensión eh, compra la electricidad a un precio, por, por decir, eh, a 12 centavos de dólar el kilowatt hora, y por inyectar energía a la red, la compañía le paga aproximadamente la mitad de este precio. Por lo tanto, eh, este, este sistema de net billing eh, es contra la facturación, obviamente, y no contra la medición neta como, como lo tiene Canadá o lo tiene Alemania respecto a, que, a una ley de net metering y no a net billing. Eh, esto está sumamente normado, existe un, un, un sistema eh, muy simple o complejo, en realidad más complejo, para poder llegar a conectarse a la red eléctrica. Esto lo, lo puede pedir cualquier ciudadano, ¿cierto? Y esto ha potenciado algunas instalaciones en, en Chile. Uh, y aquí podemos ver este incremento, el incremento de las instalaciones, eh, se esperaban muchas más, pero debido a esto de que es net billing y no net metering, ha, ha provocado un, un menor despliegue. Siendo en la región centro la, la mayor cantidad ¿cierto? de instalaciones que se han producido en el último tiempo. ¿Ah? En, en la zona sur 
se nota mucho todo esto en la zona sur de Chile, eh, tiene un menor impacto, ha tenido un menor impacto, sin embargo, en la zona norte ha tenido un mayor impacto estas eh, nuevas instalaciones eh, registradas en el meteo. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que nosotros vemos que son los siguientes pasos? Eh, se debe fomentar la creación de mecanismos de financiación. Actualmente existen muy pocas opciones para que los consumidores financien estos proyectos. Eh, hay algunos mecanismos que existen y tienen tasas de interés muy altas. Entonces, necesitamos alentar más a las instituciones financieras a desarrollar estos productos. ¿no? Eh, la industria solar necesita educar a la industria de servicios financieros. El gobierno también puede desempeñar un papel importante. Esas son como las brechas que tenemos que solucionar. Además de mejorar el proceso de inscripción hasta facturación neta. La facturación neta lleva un proceso un poquito engorroso, lento y por tanto costoso para los desarrolladores solares, eh, que quizás eh, están limitando un poco. Sin embargo, se puede ver eh, la evolución de estos últimos 13 meses, que esto eh, ha aumentado la capacidad, ¿cierto? Que en febrero o marzo de, de este año, eh, la, la cantidad eh, de kilowatts que se están instalando por potencia inscrita para poder conectarse a la red eléctrica actual. Um, en Chile, constantemente se presentan proyectos para, para ser analizados eh, y aquí ustedes pueden ver, ¿cierto? Cómo hasta hace muy poco eh, se, se ya se están aprobando proyectos de 90 megawatts y de, de 60,9 megawatts eh, como planta híbrida. Eh, hay, hay mercados, ¿cierto? Donde el, se está moviendo muchísimo el sistema solar en el norte grande, especialmente con proyectos enfocados a la minería. Eso. Quedo muy atento a sus preguntas. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, Juan José, eh, por tu presentación. Eh, ya casi vamos a ingresar al periodo de preguntas. Nada más uh, quería aprovechar para poner esto en contexto con la situación de Costa Rica de una forma muy, muy resumida. Ya además mis estudiantes ya están cansados de, de, de cuento que les, que les digo de Costa Rica, pero para contextualizarlo con lo que tenemos aquí en, en eh, con lo que nos contaron ustedes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just very briefly state the case of Costa Rica. It's actually it's very, very summarized for so we can compare it. Um, I, I will do it in uh, Spanish. Uh, so I will do it in Spanish because most of us that we are here uh, speak Spanish. Uh, well, at least the students that we are is connect. And um, I, will, I, I will just highlight some English parts for, for you guys, uh, Sebastian, and Joyce, so you can. Uh, no, no, and then we, maybe we can uh, enrich the discussion that we have after that. So um, let me just see. We have here. So, okay. Um, okay. Um, I think you're able to see my presentation. Is this correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, bueno, nada más para ponernos en perspectiva, Costa Rica es un país muy pequeño. Estamos hablando 6% de, del tamaño de Chile, 14% de Alemania y, y casi 0.5% de Canadá. Es, es una miniatura. Entonces hay que tener en cuenta que eh, eh, hemos logrado muchas cosas, pero también el, el, el territorio es pequeño. Um, y, y de hecho es todavía más pequeño que British Columbia, que fue el caso que me detalló con un poquito más específicamente Joyce. Um, y, y las cosas pueden ser más o menos difíciles de gestionar en cuanto a un sistema energético. Eh, nosotros aquí en Costa Rica, básicamente lo que tenemos es que históricamente no hemos explotado petróleo. El petróleo históricamente ha sido muy costoso, ha tenido fluctuaciones y hemos sido muy exitosos en evitarlo, al menos para la producción de electricidad. Um, de momento, eh, en Costa Rica está prohibido explotar petróleo, ni siquiera tampoco explotar petróleo. So, the, the, the oil exploitation is banned since 2010. Um, y, y, y en este gobierno, hasta que termine en el 2021, 
2022, es, es, el, todos los presidentes que han llegado del 2010 han decidido este, mantener esa situación y tenemos un gran potencial de recurso hidroeléctrico y esto eh, se ha ido incrementando a lo largo de los años. Entonces, lo que tenemos aquí es la capacidad de generación y es importante que ustedes tomen en cuenta que una cosa es capacidad de lo que puede producir una planta y otra cosa es la generación. Entonces, no necesariamente toda la capacidad que tenemos para generar la vamos a estar utilizando. Muchas veces esta capacidad es un backup um, que tenemos y que si es necesario lo utilizamos. Entonces, es normal que haya una capacidad mayor o sobredimensionada en, en, la, en las fuentes de energía que son controlados, como por ejemplo la no renovable, para poder... Eh, poder controlar los picos que tiene la energía solar fotovoltaica y la eólica. Aún así, en Costa Rica hemos seguido una tendencia en donde eh, nos hemos, hemos invertido mucho en, en capacidad renovable, principalmente bueno, eh, en hidroeléctrica, eh, pero hemos logrado a partir de básicamente los 90 diversificar un poco la matriz. Y esto es básicamente... Eh, a, eh, es eh, uh, petróleo, el diésel. No tenemos carbón en Costa Rica, so no coal here in, in Costa Rica for power generation, only oil. Y la primera planta geotérmica, eh, se, de hecho la, la, primera pla la segunda planta geotérmica en Centroamérica se, se, se construyó en Costa Rica en el 95, que fue la primera vez que diversificamos. Antes de esto teníamos únicamente térmico, un poco de de cogeneración e hidroeléctrica. Todo esto es renovable e hidroeléctrico. Y en el 95 empezamos a diversificar, agregamos un poco de geotermia. Luego en el 96, energía eólica. Y hasta el 2012 empezamos con nuestra primera planta solar fotovoltaica, así que es un poco reciente, muy pequeñita, un megawatt, que es lo que tenemos centralizada, eh, que empezó a funcionar en esa, en esa época y un par de años después empezamos con el programa de generación. Sin embargo, aquí lo que vemos es la generación. Entonces esto, antes veíamos capacidad y esto es lo que se está generando con las distintas fuentes de energía que tenemos. Um, ok, y entonces Costa Rica y en realidad todo Centroamérica por la gran diversidad de recursos renovables que tenemos ha sido principalmente renovable. Um, y en los últimos... Eh, bueno, aquí hay que tomar en cuenta que estamos empezando en un 50% y aquí estamos hablando de, un, de más de un 98% que hemos logrado mantener nuestra matriz eléctrica principalmente renovable. En los últimos eh, 3, 4 años, bueno, en 5 años ya, eh, nuestra matriz eléctrica ha sido eh, más de un 98% eh, de renovables y básicamente en época seca, ahora vamos a ver, que la gran mayoría de la energía que tenemos aquí en Costa Rica proviene de energía hidroeléctrica, en el caso de, de Canadá y en el caso de Chile. Um, ok, y en cuanto a, a, a la, cómo está diversificada la matriz, principalmente es hidroeléctrica, siempre ha sido así. Antes, como les comentaba, antes del 95, esto era prácticamente el 70-80%. Eh, luego, por la diversificación de otras fuentes de energía renovables, um, eh, hemos logrado tener eh, más, por ejemplo, eólico, más geotérmico y solar. Realmente no hemos apostado mucho a solar centralizado. So, esto es lo que comentaba eh, Juan José, que ahora también yo lo voy a retomar. No, las estadísticas, al menos en Costa Rica oficiales, que compartimos en América Latina, hacen referencia a sistemas centralizados, sistemas que son generados por las compañías eléctricas y no toman en cuenta la generación distribuida. Al menos eso es como estamos reportando las estadísticas eléctricas. Entonces podría parecer que Costa Rica tiene muy poco de solar. En realidad lo, lo tenemos, pero es 10 veces más grande y ya menos aparece aquí en el gráfico si tomamos en cuenta la generación distribuida. Y en este caso, eh, en, en Costa Rica, eh, es, es un poco atípico y con, con respecto a otros países en que la gran mayoría de la generación solar que tenemos, que van a ser muy pocas, es en generación distribuida, es decir, en las casas, 
en, sobre todo en la, en la pequeña y mediana industria y en los comercios. Entonces, esto es tomando en, en cuenta la generación distribuida para, para consumo, para, para autoconsumo. Um, eh, un una, una comentario, a, a, a diferencia de Chile y Alemania, que son mercados abiertos, eh, privados, Costa Rica tal vez se parece un poco más al caso de, de, de Canadá, en más concreto de Richard Colombia, en donde es, es prácticamente verticalmente integrado. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Que tenemos un monopolio del Estado para la transmisión, eh, tenemos un monopolio de empresas públicas, todas son del Estado, que se encargan de la distribución y todas estas pueden generar. Las eh, plantas privadas pueden generar hasta un 15%, no más de eso, y no pueden generar energía que no sea renovable. Y, se, y, y los únicos que pueden comprar esta energía de las plantas privadas son las empresas públicas. Las empresas privadas no tienen cómo interactuar con los clientes, como si es el caso de Chile. Eh, creo que en Alemania también se puede. Um, y en donde un gran consumidor podría directamente contratar, contactar a, a una planta generadora y comprar, comprarle directamente a ellos sin, sin necesidad de pasar por, por las empresas, digamos, oficiales que dan electricidad. Eso no sucede en Costa Rica. Existe una oficina que regula se llama Arecep, que define los precios al costo. Entonces, como es un sistema público integrado vertical, los, los costos de la electricidad se definen según los costos de operación de las empresas eléctricas que operan en el mercado, que todas son públicas. No hay este, un mercado eh, eléctrico como si existe en Alemania o en Chile. Eh, sí tenemos un mercado eléctrico eh, centroamericano, pero en ese caso el ICE es el único actor de parte de Costa Rica y ahí sí hay subasta de energía a nivel centroamericano para comprar y vender energía con los otros países. Um, y luego eh, quería resaltar esto que un poco complementa lo que comentó Juan José eh, al casi al final de su presentación. Hay dos grandes sistemas, las centralizadas, las plantas centralizadas, um, que estas son operadas básicamente por las empresas de la red eléctrica, el ICE, la Compañía Nacional de Pues y Luz, Copalesca, que son las que tenemos aquí en Costa Rica, y luego las, las instalaciones que se pueden instalar, en este caso en la casa, que llamamos generación distribuida, en este paso para autoconsumo, que es lo que podemos hacer en Costa Rica. Los objetivos son distintos, eh, y en este caso el objetivo es vender electricidad, en este caso el objetivo es reducir la factura de electricidad. Nosotros en Costa Rica no tenemos feed-in tariff, es decir, por ley, um, here in Costa Rica, by law, no one can sell electricity, but the utility companies, which, is, which are designed by this, no, not even customers or consumers. Entonces, eh, no tenemos, no hay forma de cómo económicamente se le pueda reconocer el excedente de energía al, 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 a, los que están, a los que ponen instalaciones en sus casas. Es por eso que lo que tenemos es eh, una um, net metering, que es lo que comentaba Juan José. Y aquí es donde vemos la diferencia. De hecho, estamos eh, parecido a Chile en cuanto a, creo que con usted de hecho que eran 49 megavatios en generación distribuida. Pues tenemos alrededor de 56, poco más de 2.000 instalaciones en generación distribuida. Y en instalaciones centralizadas, grandes, grandes entre comillas, ahora no son tan, tan grandes ni, ni por asomo de lo que pueda haber eh, eh, en Chile, eh, que son 3 y son 11 megavatios. Y aquí lo interesante que yo les he comentado a ustedes y que me parece que, que es importante resaltarse, aquí son tres dueños, por así decirlo, de 11 megavatios. Aquí son 2.000 propietarios de 56 megavatios. El gran desafío en este caso es cómo se controla eh, la energía, porque esta es energía que eh, las empresas eléctricas no tienen acceso. Alemania, nos comentaba Sebastián, tiene ya integrado la posibilidad de que la empresa eléctrica intervenga el sistema de electricidad de los usuarios, sobre todo para recortar energía en el caso de ser necesario. Nosotros no lo teníamos hasta hace poco, hay un nuevo decreto que está por salir, 
en donde ya faculta a la empresa eléctrica a tener un control sobre las instalaciones de los usuarios para poder cortar energía en el caso de que haya una sobreproducción. Eso está por salir en los próximos días. Um, y en generación distribuida lo que tenemos es net metering por un tema de que no se puede pagar al usuario por electricidad porque es ilegal en Costa Rica. Um, y el exceso que se produce en la energía luego se utiliza en el mes siguiente para reducir la factura eléctrica en un intercambio de únicamente de energía, en kilovatios. Actualmente tenemos un límite en cuanto a lo que se puede entregar a, a la en cuanto al tamaño, perdón, de las instalaciones, está limitado a un 15% de la demanda máxima de donde se conecta la instalación fotovoltaica, pero en el próximo decreto que está por salir, no va a haber un límite fijo. El límite va a estar definido por la empresa que opera la red eléctrica del país, que según vaya viendo la variabilidad y el efecto que pueda tener la energía eh, renovable eh, intermitente, pues entonces irá definiendo nuevos límites. Um, so we, we are about to have a new, a new regulation right now that it will be including the possibility to the utility company to control how um, the, actually the photovoltaic installations of the presumers, of the users, and it's going to get rid of the limits. That would, that would be the fixed limits, for then there will be a, the company which uh, is, operates the grid, which will be deciding Uh, which is the limit, so it, it may change depending on the region, depending on the circuit, we, we could have different limits. Um, y tenemos una alta irradiación, de hecho, eh, si lo vemos aquí, bueno, esta, eh, esto está en kilovatio hora por metro cuadrado, um, y lo que tenemos es, Alemania anda por aquí, Chile está, en Chile estamos nosotros como la mitad de Chile, eh, que anda por 2100, Chile es poquito menos del doble de la irradiación que tenemos nosotros en la zona norte, pero igual es una muy buena irradiación comparable a la irradiación que, por ejemplo, existe en España. Eh, tenemos una situación muy interesante que al mediano plazo, yo no diría el corto plazo, porque sí, en el, igual que en el caso que comentaba Joyce, nosotros también tenemos mucha producción de energía, tenemos en algunos momentos sobreproducción de energía, entonces, muchas empresas eléctricas no están interesadas en que se incluya más energía en la red, porque ya tenemos suficiente, al menos de forma, eh, de forma muy rápida. Pero a mediano plazo, Costa Rica decidió hace poco no, no construir más plantas hidroeléctricas por el impacto ambiental que esto tiene. Entonces, las únicas opciones que tenemos en renovables es la geotérmica, que igual tenemos un problema porque están ubicados, bueno, el alto costo que comentaba Juan José, tiene un costo relativamente alto, tiene la ventaja de que es muy estable, pero en Costa Rica se encuentran en parques naturales que están protegidos y no se pueden intervenir. So geothermal, we also have a lot of geothermal, the same as Chile. The thing is that they are located in national parks. So um, in, in theory, they cannot operate in national parks unless we have a new law, which right now is under discussion, but it doesn't seem to be getting out of the, of the Congress very soon. Entonces, eso nos deja dos posibilidades, la fotovoltaica y la eólica, um, si queremos continuar con una matriz renovable. Um, lo que sí tenemos ahora, y es lo interesante, um, y es que el gobierno actualmente está promoviendo de forma importante, o al menos era, estaba dentro de su plan de gobierno, la generación distribuida para autoconsumo. Este nuevo decreto mejora algunas cosas, pero sí, yo creo que flexibiliza, flexibiliza las cosas. Entonces, yo creo que a corto plazo sí vamos a continuar viendo un crecimiento, sobre todo en sistemas fotovoltaicos pequeños para el comercio y la industria. Ok, um, entonces, uh, this is what I have, I just want to, it, it took me the opportunity to kind of summarize what you were just saying and to um, relate that with uh, British Columbia, in which we also have a lot of hydro, the same as, as British Columbia. And we do also have, in some cases, a lot of electricity, which, and, and companies don't like to have a surplus of electricity. They are not 
in some cases not incentivating to put more solar because we already have enough in some places. And um, also with the situation of distributed generation, which is currently being pushed by the government. Um, so we're going to move forward the, the, the session of questions. I do have some questions. I los invito a que hagan preguntas. I like on this like your last slide, the lowest uh, insulation for Costa Rica is the highest insulation for Canada. <laughs> yeah, and also from Germany. Yeah, and we are in the middle of, uh, so the highest for us is the middle of Chile, which I was mm -hmm. just saying with, uh, with the Iberians map by that, uh, Juan Jose Vasuenas. Um, so um, there is uh, the, 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 the Q&A chat, está la, la, el chat de, preguntas y, y respuestas. Yo, yo aprovecho y tengo algunas preguntas que quería, que quería hacer. Um, so I have one question for Joyce regarding the how uh, Canada, so it was very interesting to see and actually we also had the same situation here in Costa Rica in which high insulation uh, places, uh, which is the coast, do not have the most of photovoltaic insulations and it's just a, a matter of that they don't have subsidies or or um, some kinds of financial problems for that. Mm -hmm. So there, they, um, and also I, I remember that in the case of Chile, they have a lot of production in the south because you have a lot of hydro and a lot of consumption in the, in the middle, right, in, in Santiago is. So I was wondering is if Canada has the same situation, which you can say there is one province which is producing the most amount of energy, and then there is another one which is uh, the one which is consuming the most energy and how does that relate with this transmission or being like a, 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 a federal government, how do you deal with that within provinces? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so in, uh, in Canada, the uh, energy is, is governed uh, separately in separate provinces. So, uh, you know, we saw in Ontario that there was a lot of support uh, in the 10 years ago um, for um, new solar PV installations. So uh, they have a lot of solar PV right now. Uh, they're also the biggest energy users in Canada. So in this case, it's it happens to be well aligned. Um, I feel like the uh, in central Canada where the solar resource is better, it's better by Canadian standards, but still not as good as uh, Costa Rica or Chile. Uh, but I believe that if there was more government uh, support for commercial installations or more subsidies for residences, that there would be more interest to reduce the payback time. Certainly where, uh, where I live on the West Coast, it's one of the most favorable parts of, you know, in, in my region um, on Vancouver Island. And uh, um, it's becoming, it's still more expensive than uh, the other options because in BC, uh, BC Hydro runs it and 90% uh, of our energy comes from hydro. So it's, uh, it's already very renewable. So I feel like there's been less support for uh, big government programs that will support solar PV for that reason. Uh, but I, I do think that the, it's becoming closer and closer to grid parity as fossil fuels become harder to get uh, the, the energy return on energy investment ratio for the tar sands is very poor. So for every one barrel of oil they managed to scrape out of Alberta, it costs half a barrel of energy. <laughs> so uh, of course that's becoming then more and more expensive to extract fossil fuels. So many people here feel that they should leave all the fossil fuels in the ground uh, as Costa Rica is doing and, and just forget about that all entirely. But Alberta is not very uh, in line with that thinking because, of course, most of their employment comes from this industry. Right. Now, well, I guess now with the with the uh, low prices of oil, there will be very big problems because tar sands is, is, is a little bit more expensive. Very much so. Very much so. And I guess uh, that, that will change the scenario. Yeah. And also uh, regarding the crisis that we are now, uh, Germany has this uh, idea of well, now it's a goal to get rid of coal and nuclear. Do you know if right now, because the current situation, like the industry is saying, let's just wait a little bit more, push it a, little, a couple of years uh, because of the economic situation that we're facing right now. Have that been uh, like on the mm. table? 
Naja, yeah, I, I think this discussion was is not right now. It was already before that the industry said we cannot do it because yeah, on, on one side we have those companies who are operating this and uh, for them it's just, okay, it's my opinion just to make money because the, PV plant, uh, the power plants are there, they are producing energy and they sell the energy. So they don't want to get rid of this because they're losing money. Um, and but right now, no, we have more other discussions, uh, not really to extend this. I think I hope there won't be any changes right now for this. And but yeah, you have always those discussions, and they try to say, okay, we have to extend this. But I think it's uh, it's very good to have this date or this year that we are getting out of this, because otherwise uh, we wouldn't change anything. And this was also because we had those discussions before when we went out of the nuclear and mm -hmm. they decide to get out of nuclear even before then they changed it again and said oh no we have to run them again and then all those um, also what i showed that the um, pv went down with the new installation was also because they said they want to run the nuclear uh, for more a couple of more years but then we had Fukushima and everything changed. And then we had the increase in renewable again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see what happened now with the current situation and the low prices mm -hmm. of oil. Um, if how it's going to change renewables, I guess. Uh, at, at least uh, in some parts of countries of Central America, which they produce energy with oil, they, they will continue because it will be cheaper. Yeah. Because there isn't just this, like uh, in, in the rest of, of so that, that that will get the the, 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 the electricity prices um, lower at, at the moment. Um, uh, Juan, y, y vos comentabas que en la parte sur de Chile está formada con muchas islas uh, y que es un poco más eh, complicado llevar electricidad. Eh, ¿Conoces de algún eh, proyecto de micro red? que se esté desarrollando por allí o dentro de las redes, las islas están interconectadas con la parte continental de Chile. Estás en mute. Mute. No te escuchamos. Estás en mute. Sorry. Ok. Hay... Hay una parte de Chile que sí tiene conexión eh, con el sistema interconectado. Sin embargo, en la parte más sur eh, existe generación diésel, eh, oil generation, um, y, y se está, prolifera más el eólico en la parte sur como un soporte. Pero se han intentado micro red eléctrica. Eh, juntando eh, eh, diésel con eólico, pero, pero no ha sido lo suficiente. No ha penetrado la micro red eléctrica como, como lo esperamos. Yo creo que principalmente eh, por la, la barrera de modelos de financiación de, económico. ¿ah? Eh, de, Uh, I need the creation of the solar specific financing model in the uh, financial institution in the lack of education on the viability of solar. Uh, necesitamos eh, eh, educar a, a las instituciones financieras en que lo solar y, y, y las micro redes son, son viables. Sí, de, de hecho, la... Hace poco hicimos una actividad con representantes del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo y nos decía justo eso. So, Juan was saying about the, uh, the lack of knowledge of the financial institutions to how to finance these kind of projects, which at least in Latin America is quite new. So you, have, you can have very high interest rates for a renewable energy project. We, we have some questions now um, for, for Sebastian and for, for, for Joyce. For Sebastian, well, actually it's related to the microbit question that I just said, um, in the sense of how do you see the possibility, you mentioned about the storage, the storage units, uh, like the LG and the Tesla power wall, uh, are still very high. 
but do you foresee like in the future we will have a mostly off-grid systems based in battery and um, how is the evolution of the like life expectancy of batteries how is that evolving in the sense of integrated that with the uh, current uh, PV installations as an alternative to and um, to use as the as some colleagues from Spain was were saying as, as a backup instead of a, like a main source you will use the grid as a backup and you will operate with your PV and your storage and then just in the case you need it you use the grid. do you see that this is like a possible scenario in the future so yeah very good question I think that we are not getting rid of the grid so that we really be off grid or maybe we have the solution yeah but depends maybe also on the on the region you are i mean if you know germany so or you saw the map so if you live in north germany if you have so much energy or if you even you have probably don't have the possibility to put so much uh, pv on your rooftop or maybe the orientation is different so i don't think that we are going to really zero percent and not using the grid anymore but what you mentioned, it could be like more like a backup. So to get more and more independent, so you produce your own energy, you have to store it, and you increase your self-consumption, I guess, yes. And that's the starting to reduce the uh, load on the grid, actually. Um, and the second part was the lifetime of the battery. Oof, I'm not the expert there. Um, um, so right now, the, the, that's why I think it's also critical right now, the economical point, so they are quite expensive and then probably they run mm, 10 years or even 15 years, but you don't get really the payback right now. That's why it's economically maybe not reasonable. Um, maybe in the future they increase and I guess they would, would increase also the performance of the battery. And I think the research and is just on the beginning and I think we will see this in the near future that the um, lifetime of battery will increase I guess. Okay thank you we have another question for Joyce. Let's see, see what happens if I just put this answer live. I, I see the question from Carlos Soto yeah. I think yeah. Yeah go ahead. Yeah so Car Carlos uh, has asked about uh, the Site C Hydro Dam in British Columbia. And thanks for the question, Carlos. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting project to be, uh, because like, like all hydroelectric projects, they represent a very high capital cost, huge construction, you know, of course, a big environmental footprint in the construction of the uh, dam. But then it's in operation for many decades. And uh, so hydropower, uh, despite its large initial cost is very economical over the lifetime of the installation. Uh, so it's attractive from that point of view. The, the dam is set to produce uh, a gigawatt uh, um, of power. Currently it's a bit less, but it, that'll be its final uh, amount. So it's a large, it's going to be a large source of energy in BC. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy around the environmental impact of the dam. And uh, also um, a, a protest around First Nations uh, rights to the land and uh, territorial uh, concerns. So um, the, the construction, the project is going ahead, but there's been like, a, like I say, it's been in the news a lot and um, uh, a lot of uh, controversy associated. Um, Carlos was asking how that affects Canada's solar plans. Um, so the, the, the largest plants in, in Canada are in Ontario, more towards the east of Canada, and they're in the order of 100 megawatts. And this, like I say, this is, uh, you know, another 100 times as big, um, sorry, 10 times as big, I guess. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a very attractive from the point of view of supporting the um, energy picture for our side of Canada, but um, the feeling is there's not that many more big hydro sites to explore. So I think that um, in that sense where maybe like Costa Rica, where there aren't any more good places to dam after this. And, uh, and I feel like after site C is a, a, a fact and is finished, then, then over the next 10 years, attention will shift more towards solar as a, as a, you know, the new source that you can uh, work towards. I think, solar and also for us uh, there's some good tidal uh, resources offshore 
and um, there's there's some wind farms. Some, uh, there's a wind farm that went in at the north of our island. Uh, there's some very good re wind resources off the coast of uh, British Columbia, uh, especially as you go north. So. Um, you know, solar will be part of the picture. I think for British Columbia, um, hydro is always going to be a huge portion of, of our, out of our pie, our energy pie, you know. So I hope that uh, answers your question a little bit. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rose. Mm -hmm. um, Sebastian, you have, you have two, two questions. Uh, if you want to address them, you, you get the first one. You're, you're on mute. You, we cannot hear you. You are on, on mute. Have to unmute. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. You unmute your you unmute yourself again. Hello. Can no, you hear no me word. now? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Classical thing. Um. No. I. am not sure if I uh, understand hundred percent. Could you maybe translate? Yeah. That's. Uh, I guess you 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 mentioned a little bit about this in your presentation. Uh. This is the the amount of uh of dollars per per watt peak for a system with storage. For self consumption, yeah. I guess what you put like 300 euros in the LG. Um, I guess yes. With that. Yeah. So actually, if you have a um, grid connected PV system without battery, so we are about $1,000 per watt PVQ pay, full system installed. Um, so this is actually the price what you have. And for the storage system, if it's a small system, five kilowatt I put here would be without storage. Yeah, okay, 5,000. Uh, dollar per watt peak and what I found is a system which is like 12,000 euros uh, with storage system and actually the government founded this by 300 euros per kilowatt hour of the capacity of the battery so you multiply this by 6.5 here uh, this is what you get if you install it so this is just um, one time you get this money for the investment uh, so but there I have to be honest it's not all over Germany because we are a federal state and right now the single states are putting different uh, fundings for storage so in Bavaria for example they're quite high or they pay uh, you uh, a little bit more and there are other systems they are starting to promote a little bit uh, the storage so that's very different so right now there's no um, one um, yeah, in order to, to actually found the storage system. Okay, and then there is another question. If you can uh, address that. Uh, um, yeah, okay, this see. question. You can have another presentation. Okay. Well, if I understand right, that is if it's difficult to, okay, we have the feed in tariff, which is by law. Uh, and if the question is if it's difficult actually to uh, place a PV plant, a residential PV, so it's not. So that's quite easy so there are a lot of companies they're doing this so you ask them they will offer you something they put it they do also all the paperwork and actually what i mentioned so the grid companies they have to connect your pv system by law so there's no uh question they can say no because maybe they are on the limit so they have to connect because also what i mentioned on the beginning we have the priority for renewable energies um i think this answers probably the question yeah, and it's also not not increase. It's, or the other question is increasing to be more difficult. Uh, it's not. I'm not sure if I mentioned this in one slide. I said that um, since a couple of years, you cannot operate your PV plant at 100%. So it has to be reduced to 70% actually. So this can be done. Actually, you can put it in the inverter very easy by software. So he will, if you uh, reach the 70%, the inverter will stop. Or will uh, hold the power, and or if you have larger PV plants, there's another option. You get the little device in your house, and then the grid operator can actually also control your PV plant. So if there's too much energy into the grid, they would switch off your PV plant. So that's the only thing which is a bit, yeah, not very nice to your PV plant. But there's other regulation what we have here. And there is one about the microgrids and smart uh, grids. Microgrids and smart, this is a very complex question. Um, there are a lot of ideas for microgrids or smart grids. If, um, to play. So actually, so we are still have a, uh, a centralized power system with all our power systems. And then we have those PV plants in the system. 
which actually are demand reduced, so what you say. Um, so there are a lot of ideas actually to to build microgrids, and I think there are also already some uh, projects what they did, and they're very nice. But there actually it's driven more by the huge companies. They don't want because they want to have a centralized system because they can make more money out of this. Because if you imagine you have a, a small city and they have their own grid and they cannot just disconnect it from the grid. So a bit more of the question before what we had to be more off grid. It's sometimes also not possible even a small uh, town want to have a full microgrid and would be independent, that is not possible. So they want to keep it more centralized and decentralized. Maybe in the future it will change and we are coming hopefully more to those uh, decentralized systems and to have also microgrids or even bigger microgrids where you can actually shift um, energy which is produced in some parts and you use it somewhere else or even with solar systems. Okay, Th thank you very much and thank you all um, for, um, for being virtually here. Um, I guess it has been very interesting for all of us. I learned a lot and uh, I hope you are continue to doing well and we can do that uh, in the future, maybe on person. Right? Yeah, Thank, you so. yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Um, luego you. los, le, gra, gracias, un anuncio para los mis estudiantes. Luego tenemos la otra presentación de Trina Solar. Eh, en un ratito, en 15 minutos, entonces, eh, eh, muy interesante, como les comentaba Harold, eh, estuvo mucho tiempo trabajando, diseñando sistemas fotovoltaicos en Costa Rica, ahora es el representante de Trina, aquí en Centroamérica, vayan por un café y entonces nos vemos en 15 minutos. Hasta luego. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Gracias, Carlos. Chao, chao. Gracias. Adiós.